It's my great pleasure to um, introduce our eminent China scholar, um, Kerry Brown, today. He's coming at a very topical time, given uh, Xi Jinping's um, visit to the US, um, where he's been um, laying out some of the more international policies and um, showing perhaps a different side to some of the policies and comments that we've been, and actions that we've been seeing in China. Um, Mr. Brown is a close watcher of Xi, so I'm looking forward to uh, his observations on that and also to the challenges that uh, Xi chases, uh, faces in um, um, amid economic troubles in China and issues of the South China Sea. Uh, Mr. Brown is currently the Professor of Chinese Politics and Director of the China Studies Center at the University of Sydney. He's written over 10 books on China, um, is a former British diplomat, and he has a new book coming out in January next year um, called China's CEO, Xi Jinping. Um, without further ado, introduce Mr. Brown. Great, well thank you very much, and I'm really grateful to the FCC and to Neil and his committee for inviting me to speak today. So I'll speak for about 20 minutes about uh, Mr. Xi and his power. So I think about a year ago, President Obama did a very un sort of unusual thing, and he made this comment that Xi Jinping was the most powerful leader of China since uh, Deng Xiaoping, maybe even since Mao. Um, and I was quite struck by that, firstly, because why would an American president make comments about the power prowess of a leader of another country? It seems kind of quite a strange thing to do. Um, I don't know whether Americans would really be very welcoming of a Chinese president saying, wow, this sort of uh, new President Trump is really looking powerful. He's the most powerful China, uh, uh, president since um, Reagan. Um, but also because I, I don't know what um, we're really talking about when we talk about how powerful Xi Jinping is. Uh, Mao Zedong, if you look at Andrew Walder's recent book on Mao Zedong, uh, was able to run a whole kind of power structure and a whole kind of culture of power totally different to the party. I mean, the Cultural Revolution from 1966, the memory of which would be very, very real to someone like Xi Jinping, who has referred, in fact, he referred during his speech in Seattle last week to his time during the Cultural Revolution uh, in the countryside, uh, because his father at that time was um, in jail, Xi Jongshun. Um, the Cultural Revolution really was about Mao Zedong, in essence, taking apart the very party that he had been so instrumental in bringing to power. And I can't see that this would ever be possible again. The Communist Party of China today is 87 million members. It has a national network. It is an extraordinarily complicated, densely networked entity, almost like a state within a state. It has its own culture, its own language. It's now even got this enormous sort of struggle going on, the corruption struggle, to enforce a kind of idea in the 21st century of Communist Party morality, Communist Party ethics. And so I can't see how a leader uh, in the 21st century, in the context in which we're in now, could do much unilaterally within that context. The best description I have of the Communist Party of China, and I think we have to think about that a lot when we think about power in China and the power of Xi Jinping, is that it is almost like an emperor. Uh, Zheng Yongnian, a very fine scholar in Singapore, has described it as an organizational emperor. It is an, like a corporate body, an entity. And I cannot see how Xi Jinping would be able to hijack this entity. I can see how he has very skillfully with political instincts elided and managed to combine um, his uh, kind of, you know, sort of interest with that of the party, but he is its faithful servant. I do not see how he can do anything without the support, without the kind of instinctive understanding of what the party is. What is, therefore, the Communist Party of China in the 21st century? What is this extraordinary organization that was founded in 1921 with only about 56 members and which lived a kind of illegal, kind of subterfuge existence for the first 30 years of its life and then really more by accident and design came to power and has been the steward of the world's uh, third largest geographically country and now the world's second largest economy. I mean, what is this thing? How do we conceptualize it? 
About a year ago, I took part in a dialogue with the man who you could describe as the sort of chief ideologue, the kind of keeper of the faith, the defender of the faith, Liu Yunshan, who I believe, as people, some of you correspondents, <clears throat> You would know Mr. Liu. He is the man in charge of the propaganda, depart uh, the prop prop propaganda department of the Central Committee. Uh, he is now the Politburo member uh, dealing with propaganda issues. He was, in fact, a journalist in Inner Mongolia in the 1980s, in which he was, wait for it, the livestock and grain reporter. This shows that there is hope. And therefore, uh, his position now is he, he is the first member of a Politburo um, in recent times. Maybe in the early period of the Communist Party, you did have journalists who were members. I think Joan Lai had been briefly a writer for one of the emigre kind of newspapers in Japan. But Liu Yunshan was a professional journalist. So he kind of has this very strange position where he's now in charge of maintaining the message. And he's regarded as a pretty kind of uh, conservative voice. Uh, in his early writings in the 1980s, he did have a fairly liberal instinct before he became a real member of the sort of propaganda apparatus, which he's been part of since the early 1990s after moving to Beijing. Um, so Liu Yunshan, when we talked about the party, uh, there was about 15, uh, 16 of us and him in this sort of meeting in Denmark and um, it was really part of a kind of dialogue to understand, you know, what is the foreign understanding of the party? Or what is the Communist Party? And it became very clear that our conceptual framework of the Communist Party is very different to that of those within it. And I think that's a problem. I mean, that's something that we all have to really address. Our language as outsiders of what the Communist Party is and the language within China of what the Communist Party is is different. So this is not a question of being right or wrong, but it means that when we are trying to talk about political issues in China and talk about the issue of power and where power is, we immediately hit a problem. We think of different things when we think of the Communist Party of China. Mr. Liu said, well, I can tell you, sitting at the centre of this, having been a member of the party for over 40 years and having occupied senior positions in the party, that we are not a party like Western political parties. We are the repository of the hopes, ambitions, fears and aspirations of all Chinese people. When one of the scholars in our group said that our model of the Communist Party was fragmented authoritarian, Mr. Liu paused, looked at him and said, we're not fragmented and we're not authoritarian. Try again. So basically, we do have an issue with how we describe the party. So I wonder whether, in looking at Xi, we can think of two, I think, three areas which are very important for how he exercises power and which we can see as he um, operates as a politician. He is, after all, a politician, and how he kind of fits in his relationship with the party that he leads and is at the heart of. The first, therefore, is the issue of um, mobilizing leadership and emotion. It's a strange thing to say that Chinese politics is emotional. We would always think of it as very structural, or very rational, as a sort of plan system, a kind of command economy system, uh, ways that Chinese politicians, the ways that they speak, are often uh, very, very kind of, uh, you know, like they have this sort of five-year, 10-year, 20-year plan. They talk in a very economically dry language. In the era of Hu Jintao from 2001 onwards, it was really all about, you know, kind of setting targets, goals, things that you could quantify. But the strange thing to me, I think, is that Chinese politics has always been pretty emotional. And that politics in the end really is about distributions of different kinds of emotional forces. And of course, with the haunting memory of the Cultural Revolution, something that really formed this generation of leadership, those in their late 50s and early 60s, emotional mobilization is a pretty terrifying thing. The Cultural Revolution, after all, was about emotion and about people's desires, about their angers, about their love for Chairman Mao, about all of the sorts of things that you wouldn't really get now because of the terrible social outcomes of the Cultural Revolution and its cost on a whole political generation. And yet, of course, today, after the era of Hu Jintao, there is this problem that emotions, the emotions of Chinese people as they come towards their moment of great national regeneration and rejuvenation, that this is an incredible political asset for a leader you can't ignore this message 
beyond all of the issues of the contentiousness in Chinese society, the fact is that once you talk about the desire of Chinese to be a rich, strong country, a fu qiang guo jia, that's the language from the late Qing, but it's been repeated throughout, I think, the last 120 years, you will get people mobilized, you will get their hopes, you will be able to reach them, and that is really a tantalizing thing for Chinese politicians. And therefore, when you look at the book that Xi Jinping has published in the last year, The Governance of China, it is quite interesting that there is an emotional register there. And the second distinctive thing, to come to the second of the third, is that now Chinese politics is getting personal. We would make a big mistake, I think, to see the personal tone of Xi Jinping when he speaks publicly as being about him as a person. He is utterly and completely political. He fits within the structures of the party. He serves the structures of the party. He is part of its assets and its narratives. And when he talks, therefore, as he did in Seattle, of his time as a lowly official in Hebei, when he talks uh, in uh, a lot of his speeches over the last two or three years, in this sort of terms of his, his personal story of him coming through very lowly positions, uh, going through hardship, uh, in the 1980s being an official in Hebei and then being in a township, being in Fujian for 16 years, then you know, kind of going to Zhejiang, Shanghai, and finally Beijing. I mean, this sort of idea of a path which has enriched his experience of a personal right to be in the position he's in, yes, that could be because he has positioned themselves this way, but it could be because the consensus within the party in this extraordinary complicated kind of organization was that this is the story that China wants to tell, the China story, the story of this personal leader with his personal narrative being a political asset to talk to people directly to try and reach their hearts and souls. In fact, Liu Yunshan, when we met him, did use this interesting idea of the problem was with politicians that for over 30 years, the story of China has been one of constant change. And he said that change has been in the material realm, in the realm of landscapes, of cities rising and falling and then kind of being rebuilt again, of infrastructure being built like no one can imagine, of a sort of extraordinarily, uh, you know, kind of huge story of economic and material transformation. And yet there is this problem of how do we reach the hearts and minds of the Chinese people? And I think this is, therefore, a kind of very deliberate thing that Xi Jinping is trying to search for the assets of a personal power based on personal narrative. Of course, we would interpret that as him being driven by personal ambition. But I think, again, we have to understand that he is located entirely within the organization that he serves. He is nothing without that organization. And then finally, there is the third thing, and that is, I think, the most sort of difficult thing for us and the final thing I'll talk about um, today, that the most difficult thing that we grapple with, which is, you know, the vision politics, the visionary politics, the idea that now, after all the years of reconstruction since 1978, uh, the kind of reform and opening up, you know, this very sort of clear moment when after all of these promises, Finally, China's moment of being a great, powerful country, of being able to deliver, uh, you know, this sort of idea of Chinese modernity becomes real. It's no longer about looking into the distant future. It's about looking in the here and now. So while we may be a little bit dismayed by some of the kinds of big political statements that Xi Jinping has been made about the kind of role of China in the world, the kinds of, uh, you know, sort of big visionary political uh, sort of idea of China being this modern power that is much more dominant in the region, we have to remember that the enemy is always within and that it is not so much the outside world of which China has had to enjoy a pretty positive and stable relationship in the last 35 years. It last really had combat experience for the PLA in 1979 in Vietnam. The outside world is not the problem. The problem is building consensus within across an enormously complicated political terrain across China's 30 odd uh, provinces and autonomous regions across its incredibly different socio-economic groups trying to speak to them. And once again, when we talk about this vision issue and we think of the audience that's important for Xi Jinping, well, we have to think in terms of what it looks like within, from Beijing, from Zhongnanhai, from right in the center. 
Who is he really speaking to when he goes to America? Who is he really speaking to when he addresses the 70th anniversary parade? Who are the people that he must carry? Because politicians in the end always have to carry core constituents for their legitimacy and for their support. Who are the people that have to buy into the vision and who are the people that he is crafting that vision for? We would usually think of there being five classes, five different groups in such Chinese society. We would think of the elite, the 3,000 strong at vice ministerial level and above in Beijing. We would think of farmers. We would think of entrepreneurs. We would think of migrant laborers. And we would think of a kind of underclass of, of un unprivileged and disenfranchised. We would think of those five groups. But it's interesting that we do, in fact, have a statement, a pretty clear statement uh, by Yu Jiangsheng, who is currently the head of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the entity that runs the United Front, uh, about how the Chinese leadership see this core audience, how they see their world. And it's a world of four zones. In the center, of course, there are the, um, uh, the, the elite, the, this is the same group, the leaders of the sort of party, the leaders of provinces, the people in the central committee, the people who are at vice ministerial level above, the people called Gaoji Gambu, the high level officials. And you can get a list of those. They are the people who must have discipline enforced, who must be true believers, who must passionately believe in the moral and administrative roles of leadership, they must revisit the kinds of ideas in Liu Xiaoqi's book in 1939, How to Be a Good Communist. They are the ones who are truly the target of the corruption struggle because they cannot keep getting so venal and corrupt and stealing materially from the party in a time of hard transition. The second group are the great middle class, you know, the 750 million perhaps in a couple of, sort of five or ten years' time living in the cities, the service sector orientated people. These are the sorts of, you know, kind of people with their aspirations and their middle class urban living, the sorts of people that Li Keqiang talks about. The third group are what Yu Zhengsheng called the disaffected, the dissatisfied, the people who believe in righteous protest, who are the nine million that I think in 2010, for instance, were petitioning the central government. But these people do not uh, challenge the legitimacy of the party. They are just irritated and fed up and trying to get justice. And the fourth group is the enemy, those who you can never trust, the people that Yu Zhengsheng said will always be against us. These have had a tough time lately. The rights lawyers, um, the uh, journalists like Gao, uh, Gao Yu, the, the female journalist in her 70s who's been put in jail for seven years for leaking apparently document number nine, these people have had a tough, tough time. So finally, I would say for Xi Jinping, the people that really matter, the people that really, really he has to carry are the group number two. They are the people who do believe in the mission of China being a great country. They do believe and get something from being stakeholders in a stable system which is predictable and gives them legal rights, the sorts of things talked about at the third and fourth plenum. So I think when Xi Jinping talks about anything, I mean, he's really thinking about these people. And I think uh, if he ever alienates them, there is every possibility that he will not look as powerful as he once did. This middle class finally have an enormous appetite and aspiration and hunger. The problem is that they expect enormous amounts of, uh, enormous amounts from the party and from the system. It is really, really hard to see how their aspirations and expectations can be easily satisfied. Such is their hunger. And I think, therefore, that the politics of China will be in the future appealing to this central group, speaking to them, trying to work out deals with them, and in the end, most treacherously of all, getting them to pay tax. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Brown. Um, we now have about 25 minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to steal the first one since I have the microphone. Um, Mr. Xi obviously set out um, in 2012 with um, an effort to reduce factionalism and vest the, the power of vested interests in the country. How far do you see that he has gone and succeeded in that, and how far will he continue to go? Yeah, thanks. So I think. Uh, Mm, the, the fundamental problem was that in the era of uh, Hu, Hu Jintao, um, the party became this phenomenal money-making machine. So when you saw uh, 
Mr. Xi shaking the hands of Mark Zuckerberg last week, you, you saw um, two very similar organizations. The Facebook and the Communist Party of China are eerily similar. Um, they are both extremely irritating. They are both fantastically good at creating profit. Um, they both have about 1.3 billion people. Uh, so, you know, I think um, the party, it's a very strange thing in the 21st century that the revolutionary party, the party of um, peasants and workers, uh, before it came to power, became this Midas that could create gold wherever it went. It just touched sectors and things, created state enterprises uh, and conglomerates and created profit out of nothing. And that created enormous moral and political issues. And I think uh, after the era of explosive growth when China joined the WTO in 2001 and then you know, the fiscal stimulus in 2008, it maxed out. It had enormous problems. Um, Wen Jiabao said in 2008, what we're doing is unstable and unsustainable, and that's right. But of course, when you have double-digit growth, you can do unstable, unsustainable things. Those, those, those times are over. So I think this was all very, very signaled. The idea that Xi Jinping is some sort of totally kind of, um, you know, uh, autonomous political actor doesn't make sense because, in fact, those issues were all known before 2012. And what he's doing is implementing a program to ensure, through corruption and other measures, that state enterprises, which are 50% of central government revenue, after all, and that's you know 70% of all government expenditure in China is through the centre, that this source of profit cannot you know continue squirrelling away enormous amounts of money off balance. So fundamentally, I think he is doing a structural thing we would understand it as being against factionalism, but I don't think these factions were particularly cohesive. Uh, the bottom line is that the party's legitimacy was being eroded by people stealing materially from its bottom line by robbing its state enterprises. Um, down here first, and then second over there. I'm Richard Balsek from AmCham. Uh, we see from our, we hear from all our business people that uh, decision making the, and on the political side, uh, provincial officials, municipal officials, higher people has been circumscribed considerably or delayed because of fear and trembling uh, around the uh, anti-corruption move. That a decision may make it difficult for one way or the other for the person making the decision. So my question is, with Xi Jinping in, in, in charge, how does one succeed or lose a, as a political figure? <laughs> um, so, where is power in this system? I mean, it's partly in the um, ideological apparatus, and we don't look enough at that because you've got to get the right message, uh, and a lot of effort's gone into that. If messaging isn't important and ideological training is important, why are there 2,000 party schools? And why do party figures at a very senior level spend a lot of time trying to learn the right ideological script? Uh, it might not mean that most people believe in this, but then it's the same as, you know, kind of medieval Latin, you know, for the church. No one understood it except the priesthood, but the priesthood have to understand it. And the parallels really between the Catholic Church and the Communist Party of China delightfully uh, illustrated last week when we had Pope Francis and Xi Jinping uh, serendipitously in Washington at the same moment. Uh, you can see that they are very similar in some ways. They want to have an ideological message which transcends their administrative and their kind of, you know, physical and uh, institutional uh, sort of existence and structures. So I think ideological power is important. Uh, so is having um, networks, but I don't think they're factions. It's much more subtle than that. It's about accumulating networks in provinces, in different institutions, in different state enterprises, supportive networks. Uh, it's about having controls of political narratives. So, as I say, Xi Jinping has this story. He's telling the China story, but he's also telling this personal story that supports the China story and the party story. Um, and I think, finally, it's about, uh, you know, kind of believing in the fundamental mission of the party to create modernity in China. So it is about belief. I, I do think Chinese politicians do believe things. They're not just sort of, you know, kind of going for power for power's sake. The problem is um, that the party covers such an enormous spectrum of different shades of opinion. You go from people who believe fundamentally in the you know, public ownership of assets to people who believe in total liberalization and marketization. So I suppose my question uh, in the next five to 10 years is, is this kind of attempt 
to create cohesion uh, politically in China through one organization sustainable. Uh, if it is possible, no other organization has ever really done this on such a scale. The USSR, um, you know, kind of Communist Party didn't do it. Uh, the Communist Party of China so far has succeeded by an enormous ability to create institutions, by an ability to create narratives, by ideological means, but I think it's becoming more and more hybrid. Um, Xi Jinping has imposed, through fear, a discipline at the moment, but fear can evaporate. And the problem is that you need an era of more positive politics. So at the moment we see lots of very negative politics in Beijing and anti-corruption always gets people excited because they like seeing politicians beaten up like we do everywhere. But I think once you go beyond that excitement, where's the real positive message about China's own identity and its economic and political future? You mentioned, uh, sorry, I'm Andrew Davis from Bloomberg. Um, you mentioned about his need to cater to Group Two, the 700 million who have a vested interest, um, and and I suspect they don't need to share his vision, but will more or less tolerate it. And you also mentioned um, various narratives, but one of the narratives is anyone who has any real money is buying property outside the country, getting passports for their kids. It doesn't seem to indicate there's a lot of faith in them being able to achieve the aspirations, which you you said are so high, what are the consequences if those aspirations cannot be met? What happens then? Mm. I mean, I think that's a huge problem. After three and a half years of being in power, despite all of the excitement and the, uh, you know, kind of drama of this new leadership, um, there's been a lot of promises, but we have to look at where's the d d deliverable. So when people say this is the most powerful leader since Deng Xiaoping, I don't see any new parameters for political activity in China. Deng Xiaoping and the, you know, kind of general framework of reforms is still is still the one within which leadership operates. There's been no fundamental reset. Uh, there's been some sort of moves to create more marketization, but that's just a continuation of the Dengist reform. So, to me, we are living still in a post-Deng China. Uh, we're not living in a Xi Jinping era of ideological kind of change and reform. Uh, if that happens, it's not happened yet. So having made so many promises, you know, I'll give you an example. In the plenum in 2013, the third plenum, 60 promises. I mean, which political party anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, in power, would make 60 promises? In manifestos, the idea is you make as few as possible. Uh, so 60 promises is an enormous amount of hostages to fortune. And I think part of the problem now is that, of course, lots of these promises about deeper reform of state enterprises are complicated to implement and are not happening quickly enough, and people are starting to become a little bit jittery. Um, the Stock Exchange is another great example. The Stock Exchange is like a theatre of aspiration. You see people kind of getting very excited and piling money in and then, you know, kind of wanting to get the government to bail them out, and I think that shows that there is a sort of very, very thin faith in whether, you know, things will work as the party says and that there's sort of a desire in the end for the party to step in and hard-arm things because policy in itself won't achieve what people want. Uh, so I think uh, we should expect an era now of the government trying to do one of two things. Either it will try to be very activist in the way that it implements policy, so that it brings home some real deliverables, and getting the Winter Olympics isn't really one of them. It's got to kind of get something much more substantial achieved um, to appeal to this middle class that's emerging, or that it will, if it can't achieve that, become increasingly, um, it'll ratchet up nationalism and it will try to seek legitimacy and support by being tough on the outside world because, of course, the outside world is always the source of China's problems domestically in the sort of narrative, even though practically the outside world, in fact, has been a source of many of the solutions to China's economic and political, uh, uh, socio-political issues over the last 30 years, particularly economic, but they have a socio-political dimension. Thank you. Sorry, gentleman in the pink shirt first, and then one there, and then there. Okay. Um, William Barkshop, Agora Partners, based here in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, as we all know, China is um, very anxious to be accepted as a core part of the world's um, financial system, for example, to have the um, renminbi as uh, reserve currency. 
Um, and yet, uh, recently, obviously, as we all know, we've seen an unprecedented uh, clampdown um, in the um, operation of the financial markets, um, which has um, uh, sort of um, very much created massive mistrust um, from internationally as well as, to a certain extent, domestically. Um, what, what, what impact do you think um, the recent financial um, market crisis will have on um, the pace or, or nature um, of uh, the China's, Chinese uh, financial liberalization. Thank you. I mean, I think it will have an impact because only a couple of days ago there was the second anniversary of the um, Shanghai uh, free trade zone and uh, most of the coverage they certainly saw, um, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal, I think, uh, and uh, the Financial Times did this sort of interview with some of the officials there and the question of what, what's it, what, what has it achieved to be beyond being this space uh, for people to come to and have offices, uh, what's, what's it really achieved? Um, so this is another issue of, you know, you've had the promises now, what about the implementation? Um, I think the uh, government, certainly, and Li Keqiang, when he's spoken over the last three years, and in fact, even before he became Premier, were really, really uh, sure that China needed an indigenous finance sector and that Shanghai would be the kind of epicenter of it. But I think also they are now finding that um, it's really hard to create the regulatory environment for that. It's very, very hard to create the sorts of public confidence and faith in that. Um, and it's hard, I would assume, because you need rule of law and you need a free press, and they don't exist at the moment. Uh, so while it's okay to create these things with this enormous energy and create all sorts of new institutions and entities, at the end of the day, they do have to have an autonomy of their own, and I don't see any strong signs of that at the moment. But the problem is, to go back to the aspirations question, that this is very important and appealing to the emerging middle class. And so I think the negotiation and the domestic conflict over the next few years will be that while this emerging middle class will not, I think, challenge the legitimacy of the party, of course, because they are stakeholders, they have been incentivized through property rights and all sorts of other things to, you know, believe or at least to sort of maintain faith in the system, they are going to ask for more and more. Uh, the bailout of the stock exchange is a very small example, but I think we are going to see more and more signs of incremental kind of negotiations between this middle class urban service sector, consuming uh, middle class, if you can call it that, and the state. And um, I think it's pretty clear that the state cannot win this battle. It must, uh, you know, kind of appeal to this middle class. I think that's the fundamental political story and economic story of China in the next decade. Thank you. Andrew. I'm To Han Shi, a freelance journalist. I have two questions. One is, to what extent is Xi Jinping beholden to the retired Chinese leaders, including Jiang Zemin and Zheng Jinghong? Is he restricted or curtailed by them in any way? Uh, my second question is, Xi Jinping is going to make a state visit to Britain um, in October. I mean, do you think the British leaders are so desperate for Chinese money, they will count out to China and uh, allow the Chinese government to have its way with Britain and um, you know, allow any kind of Chinese money into Britain, no matter how corrupt or dirty it is? Well, um, I'm, I'm British, <laughs> so, so um, uh, you know, I, I, I was intrigued by Osborne, the, the, fine, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's visit last, last week. Um, you know, it's, so in one way, I think it is a bold thing and quite an interesting thing to go to the Shanghai Stock Exchange and to go to Xinjiang. Um, I mean, the only thing that I have sort of that puzzles me is, is, you know, three years ago, Britain was in the deep sea, sort of freeze over Cameron meeting the Dalai Lama. And so I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by why there's a complete change about face. And uh, more cynical observers would, would say that's because we just want money. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, if, if that's true, um, then there's going to, I think, be a very, very unpleasant political consequence because uh, actually to have the kinds of levels of Chinese investment into the UK or to have UK investment going into a place like Xinjiang means a lot of common understanding. And I don't see that there at the moment. Uh, if Osborne was going to Xinjiang to say the British companies must invest in Xinjiang, then I don't see the infrastructure of knowledge and links and connectivity and understanding 
that would make that investment work at the moment. I don't think it's a, I think it's a very speculative thing to do. And I'm not entirely sure that politicians should be in the business of supporting speculation. I, I think that's what I would say about that. Um, on the first and the uh, old generation, I think it's a sort of structural systemic thing. I think for this generation of leadership, they would feel that they observed the, they observed the wisdom and instructions of the elder leadership during the leadership translation a uh, transition that they of course completely respect and listen to their wise and excellent opinions and will carry on doing what they need to do um, without listening really needing to take much notice of them I used to work in the British Foreign Office I really know that trick we really understand you we completely you know we really really let's involve a like, 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 like a seminar let's have a high level seminar we'll listen to you we'll go away and we'll carry on doing exactly what we did before you opened your mouth thank you sorry my yeah, thanks. Sarah Monks a member of this club um, a couple of questions that pick up on the threads of the conversation so far um, you mentioned the aspirations, the hunger, the, um, the expectations of this middle class. Presently, we can see much of that being channeled into consumption. We know that the Chinese middle class is an extremely demanding segment of consumers anywhere in the world. Um, how long do you feel that Xi Jinping has before they've run out of filling up their houses with stuff and buying cars and going on holidays, before they want to drive this negotiation, as you put it, further than it's presently going. Can it be done in the remainder of his term, which is, what, another seven years? And second, related to this, can you see any new leaders being incubated that could follow in his footsteps? And what is the present role of Li Keqiang within this power structure as the prime minister? We've seen in previous eras that there have been powerful prime ministers, Zhou Enlai for one, and of course um, during the, the Jiang Zemin era. So what are your thoughts on Li Keqiang's role? Thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I think on the first sort of uh, middle class, their aspirations and when they start to get jittery, I mean the issue in the end is uh, that there will be a kind of reformulation of the social contract in China and I think that is where the politi politics will really kind of come in because at the moment uh, the tax basis is not from personal taxation, it's from state enterprises. So 10% of fiscal revenue is from personal taxation, which is way, way lower. I mean, that's a fifth lower. Uh, no, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, in most, sort of, like in Australia or in Britain, it would be something like 60%. So, you know, the idea of no, um, sort of, you know, uh, particip no representation, no taxation without representation really kind of kicks in. And I think there, there will need to be a recalibration of that system. Uh, there will need to be less addiction to state enterprises as your bankers and more personal taxation. And that's when you'll get a middle class expecting more and more from what they get from governance and a completely different idea about public participation and decision making. Now, that's not to say that this will lead in a democratic direction, but it will need to be more transparent ways in which the party consults and involves people in decision making than at the moment. And a quarter of that is scrutiny of budgets. Uh, it's a very big anomaly that in the 21st century, the National People's Congress convenes in March to look at budgets over, I think, one day, uh, when, in fact, they are passed you know, uh, and implemented from three months before. I mean, this is very weird. It's not a year ahead. It's actually you know, retrospectively. So I, I find that you know, is one example of how this system is going to have to give more participation and seed more territory while not talking about multi-party systems, which is kind of what they're doing at the moment tactically. This is a very tactical leadership, and they're kind of seeding little bits of political space while maintaining the kind of core area of control, which is unified party rule and no talk about political competition at that level. Uh, new leadership arising, well, that's one of the kind of interesting things in 2007 we thought a lot about who are the people coming along in 2012. It was Li Keqiang, Li Yuanqiao, and Xi Jinping people that appeared really in our minds then. Xi Jinping quite late, actually. I mean, if you think in 2001, Cheng Li at the Brookings Institute, you know, was saying that Li Keqiang was the sort of chosen one. So, you know, we were doing a lot of thinking, uh, uh, people, about what sort of new leaders would emerge. It's really hard to see that at the moment. In 2017, there will have in theory, to be five new members, at least five new members of the Politburo, 
but I mean, maybe there will be ways of, I mean, there's, there's nothing written, I don't think there's anything written down about the 68 retirement age. I don't think, you know, people don't have to go. Uh, you can rewrite these things pretty easily. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, well, we always said that provinces were the places where leaders came from. This Politburo, seven of them, six came from provincial leadership positions. Whereas maybe that's no longer the case. Maybe there will be a new direction for people to come through the system. The people that are politically closest to Xi Jinping are not provincial figures, really. They're people who, you know, are, I mean, he's got this sort of group of advisors around him, people like Liu He, I mean, Wang Huning, uh, uh, who's in the Politburo, of course. Um, uh, it was Cheng Xi, who is the set number two in the organization department, has been very close to him for a number of years at Tsinghua University, where he did his... PhD. Um, and so these people are not from provincial backgrounds. Maybe we will see new routes, but you couldn't make a list at the moment of provincial or national leaders that would easily fit into uh, the sort of slots that are, in theory, coming up in 2017. And then um, finally, uh, on the question of um, uh, the, uh, what, what, was, what was the final question? Oh, yeah, that's why I forgot it. Um, because, um, you know, uh, this, is a, this is not an easy thing. I mean, I, so personally, I think Li Keqiang has the worst job in the world. And if I was Xi Jinping, I'd keep him there. Because you can always sort of say, this, this, this is a mess, and it's because of Li, it's not because of me, and that's why you have premiers. It's a bit like you have chief finance officers, you know, you can blame them for everything, um, or deputy editors or whatever. I mean, you, you know, I, I think it would be very risky to... Um, get rid, I, I think it would be very risky to get rid of Li Keqiang, I mean I don't think that would be very good uh, for the system or indeed for the fiscal sort of um, stability in China, um, but I suppose we have to say that we did you know, expect in 2012 a stronger role for Li Keqiang, uh, and maybe we haven't been noticing, maybe we haven't been seeing the things that he's been doing, uh, but he does seem to have been quite a low-profile premier. But then in 2007, I remember there were rumours about Wen Jiabao being under a terrible cloud, and, you know, when doing the Wenchuan earthquake uh, uh, in 2008 or nine, I think it was two, two, 2008, um, this idea that he was, because he sort of rushed to the earthquake site, he'd sort of, you know, upstaged Hu Jintao, and he was under a terrible cloud, but then he kind of came into his own in the final two years, was very vociferous, so maybe that kind of thing might happen too. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more question, if anybody wishes to ask. Yeah. Yolita Pons from EU office to Hong Kong and Macau. I wanted to ask you about the international dimension because recently China has been uh, has shown a lot of initiative, right? So we have AIB, we have the three-dimensional Silk Road, we we have cyber conferences of all sorts. Uh, how do you interpret it? Do you think that it's an attempt to create a kind of um, slowly, uh, invisibly, but to create an, a, a parallel international order? And when will we see a Chinese-led international court of justice? Mm. <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, uh, so finally, I, I mean, sort of to link to a, an issue of, you know, who is Xi Jinping? Who, who is Xi Jinping? And the way that he relates to the world and describes the world around him uh, relates to the issues that you've talked about because it has been quite activist in some ways. But, you know, one thing that's very striking is it's very interesting three years into his leadership that we are as bemused and baffled by what to make of him as we were with Hu Jintao. So we always were sort of going on about who, the, who is who, you know, who is who. Um, and now we're saying who is she. Um, I mean, what does he stand for? What does he believe in? And he said quite a lot about what he believes in, you know, national mission, uh, stronger China, a kind of stronger role in the region, all the rest of it. And yet we still find he's sort of hard to understand what is the nature of his power and the things that I sort of talked about earlier. So I would say the thing that's really struck me about him as a political personality is he is definitely a storyteller. I mean, he tells stories. And, and politicians that are storytellers are not uncommon, and they're not very easy to deal with. And that, in that sense, he is quite like Mao Zedong. In that sense and that sense alone, he is a storyteller. And he's a very talented storyteller. If you were to say, what is the real policy outcome of the One Belt, One Road? What is the real policy infrastructure of the China dream? People go blank. 
but there's this sort of kernel of um, mm, these these ideas kind of make sense that they have some sort of meaning that they have some content but everyone has different definitions of them so as a storyteller I think we have to see Xi Jinping but I don't think that he's ever going to unpack what the meaning of those stories are the question is in what ways will the agents of the Chinese state and its proxies be able to do things with these stories that are practical and that we can do things with? And where will they be given the political kind of space to do that? So we'll know whether he's um, a storyteller who is not a control freak if you do get people with that ability to do things with these stories. But if we find that even with these stories, people are risk averse, they're not willing to do things, then there's a problem. There's a big, big problem. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming and the good questions. Thank you, for Professor, Professor Brown. Um, pleasure to have you here. And I'll just present you with a small memento from the FCC.